the last 30 minutes or so that remain to us, uh, is I want to come to what I'm calling this fulcrum of the, of the text, this point where uh, he shifts away from explaining. I've said he defends himself. If you think about it, it's not really defending himself. What he's saying is the charges are bogus, the charges are false. What I'm doing is explaining why you have charged me. Right? That's the first part. And then in the second part, he flips it around. So let's jump to that. Let's look then at the, at the so-called fulcrum of the text. He asks then, if this is true, why then? He says, if, if it is true that you have this wisdom, he says this at uh, 28b, someone might say, are you not ashamed, Socrates, of having followed the sort of pursuit from which you run, now run the risk of dying? Right? Are you not ashamed, in other words, of having lived your life in such a way that now you run the risk of being put to death? And then he has this long answer in which he says, essentially, I have a duty to say the things I say. He makes a comparison with, uh, from the Trojan War in the Homeric text, he makes a comparison to Achilles. Achilles had a duty to kill Hector. I, Socrates, have a duty to say the things that I do, to act the way that I do. And he says that fear of death is not a motivation to keep me quiet, is not a motivation to shape my behavior, right? So it's true that maybe uh, that I will be executed uh, for having conducted my life in this way, for having conducted inquiry in this way, but is it in fact a terrible thing that I am, uh, or is, does that mean I shouldn't say it? And if you think about it, that raises an interesting question, because if the Socratic truth, or if the, I shouldn't say truth, the Socratic wisdom that he lays out is important, but saying it, living it, puts his life in danger. Where is the problem? Is the problem that Socrates is saying it, or is the problem the society that doesn't want to hear it and executes people who challenge what they think? And that defines, then, this pivot point in the text. They, there are some who say, I shouldn't say this because I should be afraid of dying. What is much worse is that a society that has to deal with someone like me is so afraid of what I am saying that they would sooner execute me than have me say it. What kind of a society is that, right? That's essentially what he asks in the second part of the text. He says, best of men, you are an Athenian from the city that is greatest and best reputed or for re the highest reputation for reputation and honor. When you neither care nor take thought for wisdom and truth and the perfection of your soul. And if any of you argues the point and says he does, ca does care, I shall not let him go at once, nor shall I go away, but I shall question and examine and cross-examine him. And if I find that he does not possess virtue, but says he does, I shall rebuke him for scorning. If you claim to live in a city that stresses wisdom, as he says, that is greatest and best reputed for wisdom and strength. If you are a member of that city and someone comes along and wants to ask you about the very wisdom and strength that you claim and you can't handle it, you can't deal with it, are you really strong? Are you really wise? And the answer that he plays out is no. He says, therefore, if, you, if in treating me this way, in putting me on trial, what you're really doing is not condemning me, Socrates, as someone who has corrupted the youth and blasphemed against the gods. What you're really doing is condemning yourselves. What you're saying is, we are the kind of society that cannot accept what? Self-questioning, skepticism, criticism. That's the kind of society it is that puts me, Socrates, on trial. I shouldn't be afraid of death. In fact, he even says in the text, I don't even know what death means. Maybe death is a good thing. Why would I be afraid of it? That is to presume to know. Instead, what we need to interrogate, what we need to inquire is, what kind of a city is it that takes someone like me, an impoverished person who's simply asking questions about why you think you know the things you know, and now has invented these charges against me in order to assassinate me, in other words, in order to silence my voice? What kind of a society does that? And at that point, when he asks that question, he, Socrates, is no longer on trial in his defense. Now he is putting the city of Athens on trial. It is now the Athenians who are being judged by Socrates. And in this way, going back to what I said at the beginning, the accused becomes the accuser. And so in the second half of the text, having dispatched with this question of why it is that he's on trial, 
he lays out the problems that he sees inside of the Athenian polity. And as we will see momentarily, they are very significant charges indeed, and ones that perhaps still may have resonance today. The first thing he notes, he calls himself, in a very famous section, 30E, look at the treatment of what he calls the gift, well, you read it for yourself, the gift God gave you. I mean, if you went around saying that you were a gift from God to other people, what kind of a reputation do you think you would gain? So have you talked to Bob? He thinks he's a gift from God. I mean, we would call that what? Arrogance and really annoying, right? Indeed. So he says, <laughs> he says, I am a gift from God, right? Killing a man unjustly and so men of Athens, I am now making my defense not for my own sake, but for yours. My defense is now not for me. My defense is for you, that you may not kill me and in fact become a better city, learn a better form of politics. This is what this trial is now about, not to defend my life, but to defend you, to defend your city. So that you may not, by condemning me, be mistaken in your treatment of the gift that God has given you, right? That you may not commit this crime against me, the gift that God has given you. And he describes himself in terms of the gift that God gave you, right? What is it that makes him a gift from the gods? It is because he says, I am like the... Um, the word, actually, the word he uses in the ancient Greek is simply, he says, the irritant to the horse, is what he says. But we typically translate this into modern languages as, and you'll see it frequently referenced, Socrates as a kind of gadfly. But if you can imagine a horse in the field, right, and its tail is swishing around, why does a horse switch its tail? Because there's always these flies. And so the horse, in order to get rid of these irritating flies, it swishes its tail, right? And those flies do what to the horse? They irritate the horse. And so the horse, this mighty thing, is constantly being irritated, not in an important way, but in a kind of modest, unimportant way, by this small little thing that buzzes around, which it's constantly swishing its tail. As he says it, if you kill me, you will not easily discover another of my kind, who, even if it is rather ridiculous to say, has simply been set upon by the city, has simply been set upon the city by the god, as though upon a great and well-born horse, who is rather sluggish because of its large size and needs to be awakened by some gadfly. In other words, a large thing that needs to, to, to be roused into action by some kind of a small irritant. Just so, in fact, the god seems to me to have set me upon the city as someone of this sort. I awaken, I persuade, I reprimand, I reproach each one of you, and I do not stop settling down everywhere upon you the whole day. My job is to go around and be a kind of perpetual, incessant, minor irritant to the city. I will not simply accept things as they are. I'm the person who's constantly going around poking, questioning, challenging, and the like just like a fly bothers a horse. He says this in 30E and 31A. This is who I am. And then the problem of Athens is that instead of recognizing that as something which is virtuous to city politics, the presence of someone who has the capacity to question what the city is doing, instead it has vexed, it has annoyed, it has irritated the city of Athens. It has caused resentment. And so now they have put him on trial. But what he wants the city of Athens to recognize is what kind of a city is it that cannot recognize the presence of this kind of thing within its midst, inside of it, as a good thing, as someone promoting political virtue. He calls it a kind of voice at 31D. He says, there is something which began for me in childhood, a sort of voice that comes. And whenever it comes, it always turns me um, from, whatever, from whatever I'm about to do away from whatever I'm about to do, and never forward. It's a voice that's asking, are you right? Is this correct? And so on. And so what Socrates is bringing this inner voice that's causing him constantly to question, and he's making it an outer voice, moving that questioning not only for himself, but to the entire society, right? How do we know that what we are doing is correct? How do we know that what we are doing is just? So that's the first point, that Socrates compares himself as a, some sort of gift from the gods, set upon the city as a gadfly is set upon the horse to awaken, to arouse, to reproach, to persuade. In other words, to keep things mixing, to prevent people from settling into 
an established point of view, but always instead to be asking. The second thing he says about Athens, and this is perhaps the truly provocative argument, is he says that I am incapable of doing that which I perceive to be unjust. I cannot, I, Socrates, cannot do that which I see as unjust. You may remember this in 31E and 32A. And so therefore, he has led his life in, pers in, in as just a way as he possibly can, right? In a way that is consistent with his own understanding of justice. And the provocative thing about that is he makes the argument that in order for him to live a life that's in accordance with justice, what kind of life must he lead? He must lead a life outside of politics, that the life led a political life and a just life cannot be the same thing. He says, I, for my part, will offer great proofs of these things for you, not speeches, but instead actions. Uh, listen to what happened to me so that you may see that I would not yield even to one man against the just because I'm afraid of death. In other words, justice to me is more important than all other things, even if I were to be killed because I refused to commit that which I do not see as just. He says, I once, I men of Athens never held any office in the city except once, right? So I've never been a politician except for one time when I was on the council, meaning the city council, and it happened that when I was on the council, you wished to judge 10 generals as a group unlawfully, as it seemed to all of you in the time afterwards. In other words, the judgment that you committed against them, you subsequently determined it was a false judgment. It was a mistaken judgment against them. He said, I alone voted against it. And I suppose that I should run the risk with the law and the just rather than side with you because of fear of, of being put to death when you were counseling unjust things. In other words, as a politician, I was compelled to act according to how I felt things were just. That's the only time he was in political life. So essentially what he's saying, the one time I was forced into politics, I was asked to do something that was not consistent with my idea of justice, and I refused to do it despite the fact that I ran the risk of death. He then goes on to say in 32D, in a very deeply discussed passage in which there's an enormous amount of scholarship, he talks about Leon the Salamis, right? He says that when the oligarchy came to be, so this is after the Athenian capitulation during the period of tyranny in 403, that the oligarchy summoned five of us Athenians into the tolos, which is the sort of round temple at the center of the city. And they ordered us to arrest Leon, the Salaminian, and bring him from Salamis to die. In other words, they were ordering men to go get this person so that they could execute him for some crime against, perceived crime against the city. As you may recall, Athen, or sorry, Socrates disagrees with this mandate. He does not agree with the idea that they should execute Leon uh, from Salamis, Leon the Salaminian. So what does he do? Does he get up in the square and make glorious speeches about why this is unjust, why this is a crime, why this will bring blood upon the hands of the city? What does he do? He goes home. He says, I departed and I went home. And he said, I suppose that I should have been put to death had the government not shortly been after, thereafter been replaced. In the face of injustice, Socrates does not take a public position. Instead, he retreats back into private life. And that raises the fundamental question about the notion of public life versus private life and the question of our duty to be just in one or the other. From the point of view of the Socratic citizen, we have then this idea that first, the practice of politics will inevitably lead to people taking decisions that are not consistent with justice. That's simply what politics creates. Politics creates situations where for expediencies or other reasons, you have to do things that are not just. Therefore, politics, the practice of politics, the participation in politics is incompatible with the citizenship of someone who has committed their lives only to just, only to actions that are just. On the other hand, Socrates is also telling us that when, the, when that is tested, when you are asked to commit an unjust act, instead of rising up and taking a public position, using your skills, whatever it is that you have, to try and argue in favor of this vision of justice that you have, you should instead retreat back to private life. You should depart and go home. And we end up then with this kind of awkward paradox 
that's difficult to reconcile at the heart of this model of citizenship that Socrates puts forth. I think we'd all agree the idea of constantly wanting to await, persuade, reproach, reprimand, challenge, and so on, the existing political, social, cultural, religious order, whatever it may be, asking questions, asking people to consider why they do the things they do, why they believe the things they believe, and the like, is indeed a virtuous activity in terms of how a society should examine itself. On the other hand, if you are that person, how do we make that reconcilable with the idea that when, there, when you are tested, you can, as Socrates say, depart and go home? Is it a public activity or is it a private activity, that fundamental, fundamental sense? There's no answer. That's the point. The text is asking us. It's not giving us an answer. It's leaving us with this question. How do we reconcile that? And there is no way in this text that we can see. It doesn't give us the answer. So that's one of the challenges that we have going forward. As we consider the Republic, we will be able perhaps to consider this question more. But fundamentally, well, there's one answer to the question, actually, if you think about it, which is you would never want to put the citizen who is committed to justice, right? And I would hope that we'd all want citizenry to be committed to justice. You would not want to live in a society where people have to make that choice. So maybe the paradox that Socrates wants to draw our attention to is not a paradox of the man, not a paradox of the individual, but a paradox of the system. That, that's the, that, that it's irreconcilable because it points to a fundamental problem not with the individual, but with the, with the, the, with the system in which the individual is living. Perhaps that's one way out of, out of that question. And of course, there's another instance of unjust injustice, right? Which is, who's on trial? Socrates. Is it just in his view that he's been brought on trial? Is he, in fact, a blasphemer against the gods? Has he, in fact, corrupted the youth of Athens? No. So therefore, the very example of his trial is a demonstration of the kind of injustice that politics uh, perpetrates. So in other words, political life is political life reaches these kinds of conclusions because it cannot be tested, or the, the decisions that it takes cannot constantly be subjected to these kinds of just forces, at least in the Athens of its time. I think that's why he's putting Athens on trial. The problem then with Athens, right, is that it is pursuing its affairs in, a, in ways that are not consistent with the principles of justice. Right? That's, the, that's the argument that he's making. Therefore, if I were to be part of the political structure of an unjust city, I will then also be forced to perpetrate injustice. I'll give you a quote. I'll come to you in a moment. I'll give you a quote that follows up on that. At 35b, he says... Those of you who are reputed to be distinguished, whether in wisdom or courage or any other virtue, will act, if you act in this way to judge me, it would be shameful. And he says, if a foreigner might take it that those Athenians who are distinguished in virtue, the ones whom they pick out from among themselves for their political offices and other honors, if, in other words, if someone came to Athens and saw the people that we have put up as our leaders, he would say that these people are not to be distinguished from women. And the idea is that in Athens, in ancient Greek society, the, the role of women in civic life was, what was the role of a woman in, 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 in Athenian society? It's supposed to be, you're not allowed to talk, right? You have no public role. You are, a, you are a private element. You are part of the family. You are not part of the state. So in other words, calling someone who's supposedly distinguished, it's like you're a woman, is a deep insult in this sense, right? It's like you, you, are, you would be showing yourself as somebody who doesn't have the capacity to act, to understand, to be wise, and the like. And so in other words, he says, based on what you are doing, it is as if this is a city run by women, a city run by people who have no reason, no rationality, no capacity for these things and so on. I apologize for this. Well, I don't apologize. It's not my sexism. But this is the sexism of ancient, ancient Greek society. We'll see it again when we come to... Um, when we come to Aristotle. But the point is, that is, a very, that is a very biting insult, right? And that suggests that what he's saying is, those of you who have been distinguished by the city, yet you are incapable of the, thing, the one thing the city should provide, namely this sense of justice to those uh, it, who live in it. Yeah? He said that by explaining the story of Leon the Salamini, he actually proved that the society was unfair. And so is he trying to prove that the trial is unfair as well? Well, uh, that his own trial. No, I mean, he says, his, he says specifically of his own trial that it's a further instance of the, un, of the injustice of the Athenian state, right? But the point being about, the point about Leon the Salaminian is he said, you condemn this man to die. You later recognize that that decision was a bad one. It was unjust. When you made it, I knew it was a bad decision. And then the question is, what did I do about it? 
Did I get up and try and convince people, listen, let's change the government, let's rescue this man from an unjust assassination? Or, what's the alternative? I said nothing, I went home, I made tea, you know, I watched Netflix. So the point is, I didn't, I didn't take on a public role, I didn't advocate, I didn't step up and say, because I see injustice, I am now compelled to act, compelled to speak. Instead, I retired and I redefined, I redefined who I was, right? That's, what, that's what's going on in that text. So, the challenge that you have is how do you, how do you it, it analyze or understand this model of Socratic citizenship that he's putting forward that can make sense of that, of that episode? And furthermore, we're about to end our class, which means we're running out of time, but furthermore, he doesn't mention it as an offhand comment, does he? The point about Leon the Salaminian and the reason why there's lots of stuff that's being written about it is he uses it as a central example of the key point that public life Life, the political life in the city and the pursuit of justice are not compatible. So it's a, it's a key part of his, overall, of his overall defense. But he then concludes in saying, you, the distinguished men of Athens, if a foreigner were to come here, they would find you as indistinguishable from women. He then concludes, right, the entire trial, not in fact on his own defense, but in fact with this kind of ringing accusation. The problem with my trial, the, what this trial represents is not that I, Socrates, have blasphemed the gods or corrupted the youth. What it, de what it demonstrates is that this is a city which is incorporating unjust elements, injustice, into its politics. And my trial is an instance of that injustice. I am here on trial not because I am guilty, but because I have been slandered. Right? Because people have spoken bad things about me. And if you don't have the way to understand, to get at the truth, then you are perpetrating the kinds of injustice that, are, that have been perpetrated in the political life of Athens. That's the conclusion of the apology. Okay, we'll stop there since we're now completely out of time. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back, we'll read the Crito, and we'll talk about that then tomorrow when we, when we come back. <laughs>